Hello, Michael Brown here today joined by Peter Sinclair, Peter from Toronto area, I'm assuming. Yep. We're talking via Zoom and have a pretty interesting conversation that's going to occur today. I met Peter years ago at the National Stereoscopic Association convention somewhere, don't remember which one, but we became friends Enjoy. and um, my wife Nancy and I always enjoy Peter's company and Peter's going to share with us today some of his involvement and experience in the field of lenticular imaging. So with that, Peter, maybe you could just give us a brief introduction who you are. Okay. Um, I mean, Michael is our guru. So, I mean, I bow to his knowledge and skills. I am more a pretender to the throne type of guy. Um, I got involved with 3D in general uh, in the early 80s. I went to a course and learned to do slide bar 3D, having never seen a 3D camera. And uh, over the years, I uh, bought a uh, 3D, a three lens wizard camera for image tech, took pictures, got them printed. My family loved them and everything. In fact, I noticed my family loved the lenticulars better than they did of my two image Revere in a viewer viewers, even though those were great pictures. And the, the light sort of went on that maybe glasses and viewers are a bit of a problem in this field. So this led me to investigating lenticulars in general. And I retired in 1997, a long time ago. I worked for CBC television in uh, documentary filmmaking, so I was sort of used to images in general and making movies. So um, the lenticular bug kind of started when I retired, which would be around 1997. Question. Were you a filmmaker or what exactly did you do? I did mostly um, boom audio okay. on location and editing in the field for... ENG, new electronic news gathering. I was sure, kind of right. a news guy. So you were uh, always so, very close to the action if you had that boom pole. Right? <laughs> yes. So I, I've done a lot of politicians, movie stars, celebrities, and I've got quite a few 3D pictures of a lot of them oh, uh, when I got into 3D. So that was kind of a nice sideline to that. Um, All right. So you started with slide bar photography. Your family love the lenticulars, but then you really went beyond. You dug into lenticular pretty seriously. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I didn't even own a computer. And um, I noticed, I love the prints I'm getting back from Image Tech. So I sort of figured, how can I do my own pictures that aren't just taken with a 3D camera? And I loved old stereo view cards. Having attended my first show uh, on accident, really, I was blown away by the whole 3D world. And I loved history anyway, and those old cards fascinated me. So I started to think, how can I make an old-fashioned stereo card into a lenticular? Wow. No computers. So, wow. <laughs> here's what I did. <laughs> I got an Olympus half frame camera, which kind of mimicked the uh, three half frames that you would get out of an image tech camera. And I photographed the left image and I photographed the left image again of a stereo card and then the right. So I had LLR as my three images, sent them in and got a half a, a print that was trying to look 3D, but it didn't really work very well. So I thought, of course, there is a difference. It needs a middle image. So there was the LL has got to be called LM for middle. So what I did then, it sounds corny, I went to got prints. I got a five by seven print of the left, five by seven print of the right, and another five by seven print of the left cut out with scissors the, the, the image in the foreground and moved it slightly halfway between the right and the left where the foreground was. Completely corny, glued it down, 
filled in the missing sliver of info, re-photographed, now I have an L, glued together M and an R, photographed, sent it in, and my God, it worked. Amazing. It was a little corny. Cut and paste yeah. photography. Yeah, cut and paste is without, yeah, that was real cut and paste. Absolutely. <laughs> so, of course, oh my God, this is great. And soon after that, I got a computer so I could do it without the scissors, at least shifting stuff sideways. And worked like that for a couple of months. And then I found a guy named Rolf Henkel in Germany. And he does in-betweens. Holy moly. He was like a poor man stereo tracer kind of guy. And he would do some beautiful little in-betweens of these old stereo cards. So suddenly I could get a much better image in the middle than I was trying to do half-assed on my own. And I worked with Rolf for a couple of years. Uh, he may, what the deal was, was he would do my in-betweens on cards I sent him, and then we'd split uh, the, any proceeds. And I didn't sell much, but it got me into actually doing the stereo views as lenticulars. Wow. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty early on. And I even went to the NSA and rented a table and tried to sell them with varying states of success. But Sheldon, my big pal, who I found, was a wonderful guy. He, would, he bought the stuff himself because he loves anything 3D. And he encouraged me to continue because I was sort of thinking, ah, should I keep this up or forget it? So kept me in the, in the game and things led from there. And I got to meet a lot of interesting people with that whole field. And uh, I even managed to get an investor out of all that. Uh, wow. In the, this led me to China. I mean, this goes wild now. <laughs> that is very wild. Well, first of all, I got to say, Sheldon loved lenticulars. I think we both realize that. And some of my favorite experiences at NSA was going to room hopping where you and he would show your different wares. And you had some just incredible pieces that I treasure even Oh, thank you. So thank you. it's fascinating. You know, you mentioned going to China, and I know you had founded Snap 3D, and we've got to learn a little bit about this. How did you get these investors decide to start working with photographic lenticular and then going to China? That's got to be an amazing story. Yeah, because I, I knew an investor as a friend, just a pal. I mean, and I showed him some of the stuff I was doing and the stuff from Image Tech, and he was blown away. He said, this is great stuff. And um, I said to him, you know, there's a guy in China that does all this stuff. He invented the NIMS Low, a guy named Alan Low. He's in Hong Kong. And the investor managed to cobble together a group of people and... Uh, Lo and behold, I'm kind of the technical guy to help them put all this together. And by a, a very lucky sideline, Alan Lowe's office manager, a guy named Ken Can, lived in Toronto half the year. Wow. So I got to meet Ken. We got along great. And Ken says, I'll help marshal this whole thing. Nice. Uh, so we went over to Hong Kong. And um, he was, a, I learned how to work their machine, their giant CPX, sort of the uh, flagship last film processor uh, in 2003. And um, everyone was interested in, obviously they were interested in having a North American market and the whole thing was kind of going um, big chit chat on how to do all this. But in the end, um, nothing really happened. Um, during all this, Image Tech in Georgia folded, oh. and all the proceeds went to a guy in California. And he ran it for maybe a year or so, and he didn't want to be in the 3D anymore. So his machines became available, and he had the old Image Tech machines. So in California, was that? when they were processing Nashika film, or was that something different? They were doing both three and four image 
print. Okay. So you could send a Nishika or an Imslow or any of the three lens film cameras to those guys. Okay. So it was, they took on everything they could get. But the guy wasn't a 3D guy. He was more a businessman. His heart wasn't in it to go through all the stuff to learn it properly. Uh, so I got through the grapevine. I got wind that this stuff might be for sale. So I told my investors this. And they cut a deal with the guy to buy this guy named Este in Chatsworth, California, his stuff. So wow. me and one of the investors went out there cobbled together the stuff, shipped it to Toronto, the machines and cameras and uh, the trio camera, I think was the one he had and uh, mailing lists. The guy had thousands of names of people who had been customers, Wow, which uh, was a valuable asset for the company. That must have been pretty exciting to <laughs> it was. do all this to Canada, be starting a new business. <laughs> I know, and I'm just sort of, I'm just watching all my expenses are paid. Like, it's, kind of, it's fun. I'm getting to play, uh, play Mr. 3D and all this stuff. Um, and I learned how to operate that machine, the old-fashioned machine, by, uh, again, Ken Khan sent as a repairman from China, because they used to re repair the old image tech machines. And he sent them to Toronto. He set the machines up so they're working. Uh, got the print paper and everything set up. And then it, uh, it just sort of dissolved from there. Really, the, my investors were kind of putting on a front of having a showcase business as opposed to really being interested in it. Wow. So it's a bit of a business decision. And I was trying to really do a business. <laughs> and it just sort of fell through from there. So it kind of fell apart after a year or so, and they got rid of all the equipment. I don't know where it went or how they got rid of it, but uh, so that one ended, that little episode. <laughs> so I've got a question for you. Since you've operated one of those machines, and let's say you have a three negative system, does the operator actually decide where the zero point is and adjust the negatives in any way before printing? Yes, you, you, you pick the focal point on image one, little X, you kind of roll the X around until it's on top of the negative on the no, let's say a typical one would be a person. You put it on their face and then match the left, right, and middle all to the eye. And do you, were you doing that manually? Like would you put an X on the eye and then slide another? Yeah, but it was all done very quickly. Because okay. you set that first X, the carrier moves quickly. You can re do it, set the next one, sets the last one, and then re goes to the beginning and starts the printing process. Okay, so it, it, it wasn't automated. Little. It wasn't a matter of you putting an X on the eye and the frames just match it. You had to manually move it. Yeah, but, but super quickly. It, okay. Uh, and uh, in in... The way it went, you could do, I don't know, a, a, a whole roll of film, 16 prints maybe in, I don't know, five minutes maybe. I, f I forget. I mean, I couldn't operate the machine now. I have no idea. I forgot it all. However, I took videos of everything I did most of Oh, that's cool. So guess who's going to end up with them? Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so and an, as an operator, you wouldn't see the image in 3D. You'd see it 2D on a... Display, yes. Right? I, in fact, I, I'd see a raw negative, an orange colored. Oh, okay. It wasn't even uh, made into a positive. Now, now the newer machine, that uh, CPX, which was sort of the flagship last print recorder, that one, if I remember correctly, would show you a full color picture positive of the image. And is it true none of those machines exist anymore? There's no more photographic processing of those camera negatives? Not that I'm aware of. Um, there was quite a few floating around in those late 90s there as image tech went under. There was even a guy in Baltimore who had a couple of machines up there. Really? That, <laughs> I know. And I got to meet him and went down there and uh, he did some of my printing for me. And uh, he was all hepped up on working for this investment company as their printer, but it fell through, so it, nothing happened. But 
a guy named Terry, he had a couple of machines from his local Baltimore printer. Somehow, I guess they became a sub person to Georgia. I'm that guessing. amazes me. I, in my imagination, I always thought there was central processing in Georgia until they folded and the equipment went somewhere, but I never realized there were many multiples of these processors all over the place. I only believe that, yes, Georgia had the bulk of all the machines. They all went to California, that guy. But I do think there was one operation in Baltimore. I'm not aware of any other operations that were around. OK, wow. So uh, but it, uh, yeah, so I kind of got tabs on where all these printers were at one point, And they were all not wanted at some point. The mm -hmm. big bugaboo of all this stuff was the print material. Oh, yeah. It had to be custom made and a special coating. So that I think the lens was made in Switzerland or something, and it had to be coated by Kodak. Because uh, Alan Lowe had ingeniously built the sort of RGB back on these things where you literally, the light is shone through the front of the lens. So there was never a registration issue. It's not like you did a print and then glued it on the lens. It was mm -hmm. done right through the lens. So they made beautiful registration prints and it worked very well when it was in its heyday. But uh, this whole material started to get hard to get. They had to bankroll a new uh, bunch of it. They just couldn't afford to do that, I think, at the time. And that was sort of a failing thing on its own. It was normal processing for just film uh, on the back end of that. So, and nothing digital. <laughs> yeah, somehow I forgot all about the fact that you'd have to manufacture that, coat it with an emulsion, coat it with the white backer. And so it would be expensive, I'm sure, just to make that yeah. one's material. And they also had transparency material which was clear on the back. It was no white backing on it. So yeah. I saw some samples, actually, you, you gave them to me a few oh, years yeah. ago. And why did they use that? Were they thinking of a commercial market or why? Well, I think for back, I mean, I love the transparencies. Did you get one of my hockey ones by any chance? Or do you remember? No, what the, the two was? I have, one is a woman tossing leaves in the air. Oh yeah, are, yeah. Two That's models right. out in like a farm scene. Yeah. That, yeah, uh, though, those transparencies, you put them in an, a light box and they're far more vibrant and rich in color than the reflectives. No, they're spectacular. In, I, in fact, I had them on the light box this morning. <laughs> oh, did you? Oh, good. Well, you, I don't have any myself anymore, so <laughs> I'm glad the torch has been passed to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So t tell us about China and going there. Okay, so I really had two rounds in China. I had the first round in the uh, early nine, uh, sorry, early 2000s. And then I uh, learned the machine, the big CPX. Then my first investor group kind of failed. And then Ken and I were big pals by this time. So we went to Korea and he introduced me to another printer up there who did the typical print on paper laminate to a lens type of uh, oh, printing, okay. not the Alan Lowe style. And uh, so I got connected with him. And then about four years later, uh, in the four year interim, uh, I was working, I was doing stereo jets uh, mm -hmm. from Boston, which was just two, yeah, Polaroid system, nothing to do with lenticulars. And I was still working the little trade shows with prints that I had sitting around. And Alan Lowe would do my printing if I sent it in. So I had a pipeline to still do bits and pieces of work. And then in 2007, a new investor pops up really? <laughs> in Toronto. So Ken and I and the investor all met in Toronto because we were all there living there. And uh, this guy got interested. So <laughs> back you go to Hong Kong. And uh, the new investor is intrigued uh, because one of Alan Lowe's uh, fellows has got the contract to do all the um, mascot pictures of the Olympics wow. in Beijing as lenticulars. He, he can 
make as many as he could and sell them. But the trouble was he didn't have the machinery. He didn't have the infrastructure. So the investor was supposed to provide the infrastructure. But it had to be done very quickly because this was all 2007 and the Olympics were in 2008 in Beijing. So what went wrong there was it was just too slow for the money to come in to make enough machines to cover the order. So that deal fell through because that was the highlight of the business was that massive deal. And then later production would do other things in 3D, but it, it was all hung on this huge deal. And once that huge deal fell through, uh, the investor got lost interest in this and uh, also, the 2008 uh, stock market crash happened around that time. Yeah, that's right. And all his investors pulled out and were circling the wagon. So it failed again. <laughs> but in oh, all times. So close. <laughs> yes. It's like the guy who invented six up, you know, didn't make a nickel. The guy that invented seven up made yeah, a fortune. There you go. <laughs> Riches. So but I'm having fun during all of this. Oh, it sounds, it sounds very interesting. So how about meeting Alan Lowe? Did he have any neat history to tell you or? He told me a bit of history. <laughs> um, some of <laughs> some of we don't want to repeat. <laughs> some of it is, uh, yeah, really, uh, there was a sort of, it was weird. They had a uh, too much success. Really? That's possible. They sold so many cameras, they couldn't handle the printing. The bottle lick was getting prints done. Interesting. So people, and I think one of their stickers was free first roll of prints or something when you buy a camera. So they got stuck by not being able to handle the printing from the masses of camera sales. Wow. And Alan Lowe fell out with Jerry Nims, who was the sort of marketing guy. That's hence the Nims Lowe. Mm -hmm. The two guys' names made the camera. Uh, so Alan's a technical guy and it fell through and uh, Alan sort of, you know, the company disintegrated and he left and set up in Hong Kong. Now, I remember around that time period seeing pictures in the ISU journal of these very interesting multi lens cameras, like a five lens camera. And for a while, I think you were selling those or repping those. Is that true? Yes, yes. <clears throat> Since my first visit to Hong Kong and my relationship to Ken Can, I became a, a rep for all the cameras that Alan Lowe was making, which were all these nice film cameras, five lens film cameras of various focal lengths. Uh, one was medium format. Uh, three of them were 35 millimeter and uh, put in negative film and sent it in and they made beautiful prints off of those things. They were wow. gorgeous. And I, I didn't sell very many, but they were on a table at an NSA show and sell the odd one. What do they typically sell for? Like a, that five lens, 38 millimeter. I think it, I think the cost to me was something like $600 or something. And I think I sold them for, a thousand or eleven hundred, but I'm speaking from memory. I don't know sure. for sure. Well, that gives me a ballpark idea. Something. But David Clutho was the star of that thing, the sports photographer. Because David got one of these cameras and he took cover pictures for the stereoscopic magazine that was done in 2005. I, I have an issue with a boy with a yo yo. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there were five different pictures. I think a poker player, a guy with a yo-yo, uh, a catcher with his mask, a football player with his mask, things like that. But, and they were put on different covers. And uh, I think it was a big success. Everybody had fun with that. And Jan Barad, who was the editor, was the one that made it all happen. She was wonderful with that project. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I can't imagine gluing all those onto the covers. <laughs> yeah, luckily I just sent the pictures in it. Oh, they had, uh, yeah, they had uh, peel and stick uh, glue on the back, like whatever gotcha. it was, paper release glue. Yeah. Gotcha. Now, I also have seen pictures in the past. When you move beyond film, you had these uh, Canon TX1 camera arrays. You want to tell us yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah, this is my love affair with the TX1 rig I had. Uh, 
I again learned information about how to make one on the internet, which I was now into the computers and put one together. And my goal was always to get high speed lenticulars, not just sort of still shots, tracking bars thing. I wanted to get sports photography. I love to take sports photography. So the TX1 thing seemed a good solution to that. So I managed to get, uh, bought on eBay, a bunch of TX1s. I got a guy to make a cables that would all cobble them together to a switch to fire them all at once. Followed the stereo data maker to get the cards all loaded and put into the every one. Put them on a bar, got a guy in locally to make a bar, uh, all beautiful clamps and rig to set them up facing parallel. I'd always shoot parallel so I could do any towing in later, focal point picking. Um, and it all worked great, except for one huge flaw. The batteries would not last. Oh. So you'd have 10 cameras on this thing with their little square batteries and one would go out. Number six just went dead on you. So you try and move them apart and put sixes, but then number four went out. <laughs> it's like whack-a-mole, I called it. You could never get the damn things up and running long enough to be able to uh, get sports pictures. And a local guy that I knew from CBC, who was an electronics genius, figured out the solution to this, which was to make a central power supply for all the cameras. Forget the little batteries. And the, he made a little box with, uh, ran off a big uh, car bat, not a, a uh, car like a 12 volt battery, but one of those model car batteries. It would run everything for two and a half hours. Oh, nice. For full power. And you could switch batteries even. It had two tails. So even in, as you're getting low on the one, you can put the other one on and continue. Uh, what the difference this made was you could go to a sports event, fire the cameras all up, and not worry that they're going down. And what that meant, I could stock a sports event especially tennis, because I got good access. And by putting the, there was a way to fire the switch to where you push the switch halfway, all the cameras focus, push it all the way, all the screens go dark. So you're now looking at nothing. But this isn't a problem, because you're shooting wide anyway. And what you do is look at the action. And when the action does something wonderful, you let go of the switch and they fire simultaneously with around two fiftieth of a second sync. Wow. This is magic because I would just sit there, sit there, and then there's an exciting play. I let go and I capture it right at the moment. No lag, no shutter lag. Beautiful. And it worked how, really well. How many, how many cameras did you use, Peter? Uh, when I, I was invited to the Rogers Cup, uh, professional tennis in 2012 and I took uh, 12 cameras there Okay. and a giant bar to, I couldn't lift this frigging thing far so it was all on a tripod <laughs> and I got a good location and just parked there and watched stuff happen and got several great shots of tennis guys lunging for the ball or you know and and luckily it's very intuitive in other words if you miss a shot big deal just reset get ready again. And it was no uh, whoop to sync, get all the, f on all 12 cameras, you could always find the shot you wanted because you would screen, say camera one, find a great shot and just find the matching shots and all the others. But in handheld situations, I carried six cameras because it was more hand happy. I'd have a shorter uh, slide bar thing that was mounted, put the, uh, power box on my shoulder and I was able to walk around to things like busker fests and things. Now were those printed then on photo paper through the chemical process or were those digital prints that you laminated? They were laminated by the uh, generally by the guy in uh, Korea. Okay. My, uh, my, my eyesight isn't the great. I used to do my own lamination when I went down to micro lens and learned their systems. I bought lens, tried, but I found I was always getting more lines. I couldn't quite align the lens to the print properly through my poor eyesight. 
So I tended to farm it out. And I also did some through the Allen Lowe system. So these are all digital files, but I would uh, s send them off as negatives. I had a film recorder at that Really? Time. Oh my gosh, that's interesting. So, so you went from your digital files to the film recorder and then yep. sent it for processing. And how many frames did you use when you did that? Three or Usually four? Usually six frames. Six frames, okay. He, he could do more, but I never sent more. Uh, just six was enough. And it did a good job. I bet. So, yeah, I mean, that material is so fine in resolution. I mean, yeah, the lens, it's a 179 LPI lens on the Allen Low system. Very mm -hmm. fine lens. Very good for close viewing. And you can't even see the lens. And uh, stuff works very well that way. The stuff from Korea was 60 LPI, much good for, say, six feet away type of distance. Sure, sure. Yeah, so everything seemed, well, you know all about this stuff. <laughs> so, But in general, I got prints what I wanted on two systems, and I was so pleased with the Korea thing, I just did it with them. It was sure. just easier, and, and I could do more images. I could stick 12, and I'm even doing some tests that I'm waiting for. I've done up to 24 images. Wow. On, through stereo uh, tracer, whatever it's called. Sure. Try the ones that'll make the in-betweens, because that was the big monster. I had to use real pictures. Of course, they're beautiful because there's no artifacts in real pictures. Uh, so, and well, I, when you start with that many, it's pretty easy to make tweens. I mean, if you have 12 to go to 24s. Nothing. Yeah, that's in my test, I would do a tween from one to two, and then two to three, like little baby tweens. So no, no big parallax moves. Gotcha. So the, the in-betweens are really cleaned, very little uh, aberrations in them. So, so tell me about your visit to Microlens. That had to have been <laughs> interesting. Yeah, I mean, I just called, I didn't know them. I didn't really use their materials much, and I just called them on a spec, and got chatting with Ken Conley, who is the owner, a wonderful gentleman, a sort of classic Southern gentleman with very great manners. And he sort of invited me to come down and hang out. Nice. And <clears throat> so I came down there and stayed four days. And wow. And, and I made notes actually, which I sent you on my visit. So <laughs> Excuse me. So he showed me uh, how to interlace with the super flip thing, how to set up the printer so it'll print the picture properly, how to, you know, he just showed me how to do this stuff. And that's where I got the lens to try it. <laughs> Had I only known, I've, I've been there a couple times for maybe an hour each. Had I known I could camp there for four days and hang out, <laughs> I would have oh. loved that like 10 years ago. I. Believe me, if I knew that you were around, I would have sold my spot to you because you would get far more out of it than I did. I was kind of lost with all the information. Uh -huh. And you're the flag carrier now, I mean, of all things lenticular, so I'm very yes, pleased. Uh, yes. Ten years ago, I was probably in your same position. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really, that's pretty cool. So I've so, had a great, uh, great experience meeting all these people, seeing operations. You know, another person that you mentioned meeting, who I'm really curious about is Douglas Winnick. Yes. Because apparently in the 40s, he developed this way of embossing film, and then you would actually be able to look at it, and the embossed film act as, as a lenticular. And I read these old newspaper accounts of how fantastic that is, but I've never with my own eyes seen one of his prints. And I understand you actually met him in person. I met him uh, back when I retired again in 1997. I was interested in learning on how to do 2D to 3D conversions. Mm -hmm. And two guys, a guy in California and a guy in Oregon invited me to come over and stay with them and learn. And part of that was I managed to communicate with Doug Winnick who lived in Carmel. Okay. So there I go. I phone him up, ask, can I come on over? And he said, sure. I brought some of my uh, really early bad uh, stereo views to show him that I'm in lenticular too. <laughs> and he was a very gracious gentleman. And he 
talked about his uh, his uh, lab or whatever he had in the 40s, a studio, and he showed me some beautiful prints, mostly transparencies, if I remember. Very fine lens, or if there was a lens, I couldn't even tell. Wow. That just was magnificent. And I believe he did a kind of uh, hard moving lens with a lenticular at the back or something. I believe. I don't know his technical way he did it. Sure. But I did buy one from him. I had a about an eight by ten of a woman in a spinning wheel, and uh, it was just gorgeous. And I I think I sent it to Sheldon. <laughs> I believe. I, I never kept this. I moved to an apartment. I don't have room for half of this stuff, so I can <laughs> give it away or send it away. So well, your boss was Sheldon's gain. So and and somewhere in my uh, files, I got pictures of Doug Winnick and what he was doing. Like I was always taking pictures of stuff, just wow. to see what I'm doing. Oh, well, that's great. So nice. if I ever find them, I'll let you have them. I'd appreciate that. Yeah, but there, yeah, a guy from the 40s was doing this stuff, modern guys, Alan Lowe with businesses, like, it's just amazing. And I was really impressed by the graciousness and the uh, generosity of all these people. There was nobody hiding dark secrets or, you know, like yourself, you're so generous with your knowledge and everything. It's really appreciative. And I, I feel... I, I have no right to sort of hold back anything I might have learned. Not that I would anyway, because I meet people who are generous. So let, we, this has to go to other people who can carry the ball further. Well, I agree. It, it's a community of like-minded people. And the way to make advancements is for everyone to share. You know, if someone holds on to something and then dies with it, what, what good has that? Yeah. My, so I have another question for you. In the pictures you sent me, you showed the low camera with those colored circles around the three lenses. Yeah. It was a digital camera. Yeah. What was that all about? That was when he went working with William Fu, a guy in China who has Camex. He's a real camera manufacturer. Okay. So Alan Lowe took some of his technology over there and working with William Fu, who also I've met and did a show with him, uh, who has the capacity to make things. Mm -hmm. And they came up with that duplicating the old three lens film camera. The weakness, a couple of weaknesses of that digital camera though, it was good for stuff outside, but inside it was horrible. Everything was either blurry or it wouldn't uh, expose correctly. And they, their so-called flash of course had the, mistake a lot of them make is in the middle of lenses as opposed to on the end which would make it better so, so i assume those were prototypes they never really manufactured those i i think he he made them so i was supposed to be helping sell them and i have one right now oh and i use it outside beautifully the shutter is high enough it, it's auto exposure so you get a good so nothing's blurry or it won't take sports like a tx1 but it's good for just you know, normal portraits outside, stuff outside. I shouldn't say portraits, just, and three lenses is nice. And uh, they have a software that'll put it all together and you can mail it in for a print, still for this day. Wow. Uh, William Fu will print your prints. So do you think those five lens cameras, is there a warehouse in Asia that still has any of those? <laughs> are they, are they yeah, gone? It's right next to the elephant's graveyard with all the oh. tusks. And, and then the amber room from <laughs> well uh, you're probably I, right those old film cameras may be sitting in a warehouse somewhere uh, and alan low would know because he's the guy that made them and i saw some prototypes he had there's one that just looks like a giant box with the five lenses <laughs> did you go to the nsa convention when kodak had their depth imaging and dynamic imaging yeah, a guy named Joe Rabot. I was talking to that guy from Rochester. Okay. And they had really coarse lens and really fantastic animations with complete extinction between the image. Really super duper stuff. I never went to any convention or anything. At, I never visited the factory in Rochester, Kodak okay. or anything, but I spoke to the guy and got samples of it all. 
Gotcha. I did say the I did see the very first digital camera. I saw that in the yeah. What was amazing is I you know Steve Sasson was holding it. It's now in the Smithsonian because I oh, saw it a few yeah. years ago. Just it's locked in like a plexiglass case that the public <laughs> can walk by. And first digital camera. Did you know Steve Sasson, the guy that? No, not personally. In and fact, when I worked at Kodak, they never mentioned that camera. This was a whole PR thing that happened just before. The company really tanked because in the early 90s we were selling the you know digital cameras based on the nikon bodies and everything and oh yeah no one, no one at kodak said oh we made the first digital camera that came out like a decade later when they were going down the the tubes and they stored it on a cassette like I a sound that. cassette <laughs> what actually amazed me was that they had the unit at all. I was thinking Kodak must have a warehouse like at the Indiana Jones movie that has all this old. Yeah. <laughs> because how do you say, well, Steve Sasson worked on that 30 years ago. Let's go, let's go pull that out. I don't know. I'm assuming maybe for patents, they have to keep certain things. I don't know, but. I don't know either. But uh, yeah, he, uh, what else was funny about, oh, he brought a picture taken with it. And it was very blocky pixels, like 80 pixels by 42 pixels or so oh, side. That. But you can see it was sort of a face, but not very good. Well, when I worked in the late 80s at Kodak, I was with a group called Spin Physics, and they made a 1,000 frame a second camera and a 2,000 frame a second camera. They were both electronic. Oh. And I still remember the resolution was 240 pixels horizontally by 192 vertically. And we were selling those things for between 70 and $150,000, you know, and, and they were black and white. So my phone vastly outperforms, <laughs> you know, yeah. the high speed camera of, of that generation. Well, I've got a Casio rig. I don't, I think I might've written something about it. Would you mention it? I, I bought one of those too. The EXF1. Yep, yep. And the FH20 is a cheaper version, but yeah, it'll do a thousand frames a second. Yeah. But it's only like 36 pixels by, it's very it's, small. It's uh, very low. It's file it's, size. It's, I, thought uh, I actually, I made a lenticular with, with one. There was a time I was at a Lipizzan horse show and this horse jumped and I captured it in high speed. And as you said, the resolution was maybe 600 by 400, something very low. Yeah. But I printed that thing on 15 LPI and I've sold quite a few copies of it. I mean, it really, lenticular so low resolution to begin with. Yeah, that's the lucky part, eh? As you slice yeah, it. Is. But um, on your, did you have it as a 3D rig or how did you get the Lipizzan in 3D or is it just an animation of the Lipizzan jumping or something? It's an animation that looks like it's in 3D because as the horse was moving, I don't know if I panned because the horse was moving, oh, but yeah. I, th I think that's it. And whatever direction I moved, once again, one of those lucky accidents. Yeah. So you see the thing in 3D and the motion and it's... Wow, and they created it, it worked. Yeah. Well, I even been printed, I gave to Alex Hornstein, he did some tests with me for the off the looking glass. And, and it, oh, some of the, sorry, some of the conversions from the AI Google was 288 pixels oh. by 300. Very small file, but I printed an 8 by 10 with uh, like 16 images and it looked good. Oh, awesome. It didn't look super grainy or anything. I figured it'd be hopeless, but it looked half decent. But well, I, I, I was just going to say, say I think there's resolution enhancement because, as you know, with the lenticular, you never just seen one image; you're seeing a cluster of them. Yeah. And so I think that helps boost the resolution and also get rid of the noise, which is a kind of a hidden benefit of lenticular. And I love those grayscale maps because you can get a tiny grayscale map and blow it way up, and it's still good. Yeah. doing the 3D reading because it's just grayscale. I guess there's not much to go yeah. wrong. I know so little about that and I'd like to learn His more. Name. Are you? Yeah. He just posted some things. He bought an iPhone 12 and he ran it in portrait mode and that gives you your picture and it gives you a depth map. And it was the cleanest depth map 
I've ever seen that was not hand drawn. You know, when people hand draw them, they're nice and clean. And usually the cameras have these blocky yeah. ones, but these were gorgeous. And I'm thinking Apple must have a way of using the dual cameras on the front in combination with AI, artificial intelligence to clean up those depth maps because they were just gorgeous. Are, are the lenses, they're offset somewhat. Maybe one is taking an image and- The lenses are slightly there. offset. Well, the, the lens, look, this is last year's model, right? So is the lenses are offset. But 12? when I put this in portrait mode, yeah. it takes the picture and gives you a depth map. And those are good, but they're not as good as the depth map the newest phone has. They're just, oh. Those are just unbelievable. Is there decent parallax in the depth map to the image? Yeah, it works good. I, sh I should say you're limited with my model phone to be fairly close, like six or eight feet. Once you get beyond that, it's not very good. But it is called portrait mode. And if you're taking a picture of a person, right. it's entirely suitable. They're close. Yeah. Well, that's great that that's coming out. Because if they would ever put this depth map off to the end of the camera, you get more punch to this depth map for further away shots, maybe. Right. Well, apparently they have one now, the, this newest phone. It has what's called the LiDAR sensor. It's light detection and ranging. And so it's actually putting out a grid of invisible dots that are projected on the scene. And then the camera senses that and builds a depth map based on the contour from where those dots fall. And I think that's part of why these are so good. And I think, oh. I thought I read that works out to like 15 or 20 feet. So, wow. But his expertise is in uh, doing 2D to 3D conversion. And he has sent me some frame sets. Like he'll, he's done a lot of these movie posters and he'll, he'll send, he sent me 40 frames that I could interlace. And his stuff is mind blowing because he knows how to separate everything into layers and then have a depth map for each of those individual layers. And then he generates the frames from that. And so the frames have none of that tearing, but wow. you really, you have to have it up here to know how to do it. And I noticed one difference between you and I, you were able to carry very heavy rigs <laughs> in the field where I'm like, no, I'll just use one camera. <laughs> I, I was too dumb to know what to do. So I was forced to carry a whole studio on my back. You had a couple pictures, which I absolutely loved. And one was you out on the street with the, tri the heaviest duty man Frodo tripod in that long bar and all your TX1s on there. And you're <laughs> facing like the street. And I'm thinking, and what are the neighbors thinking? <laughs> what, is <this> guy? <laughs> what is this guy up to? Well, I had a security guy think I was in some kind of weapon or something. Oh, really? <laughs> and you can't, in the old days, I would take my daughter, we should go to wading pool when she's eight years old, back in the film days. You can take pictures of your daughter playing in the water. Try showing up with cameras now. Oh, yeah. No. Shoot children in the water, you know, or anything. No, you're you're going to well, be arrested. Well, before you're arrested, you're going to be beat by 20 ladies with their purses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the ones that I have hanging on my own wall are mostly 2D and 3D conversions. I've got my daughter's first birthday party oh, with nice. her in a little high chair and a hat. That's a conversion and it's a lenticular and it's on the wall and it's the subject that's everything. Right. I found that even in one of my early uh, NSA shows. I had a, a kind of experimental cat it wasn't the best of other ones I had, but a guy insisted on getting the cat one because I was trying to show him, well, this one's a better. He said, no, it's the cat I want. It's subject driven. So the visual experience is to your subject and your interest a lot. I, I agree with that. And that's one of the reasons I've never figured out why the 3D portraiture never took off. You know, Bonet went out of business doing it. When you think yeah. of Nimslow, everyone's taking pictures of their family. Those should be the most highly valued pictures imaginable. But you often see on eBay, you'll see, oh, here's stereo realist slides of somebody's wedding and they're, they're for sale for 
you know, pennies or, or dollars. And you're thinking, what's with this family? Don't they treasure these wedding pictures enough to, <laughs> to keep them in the family, especially rare 3D, but apparently not. <laughs> Even I got a I, I sent you something about uh, Niagara Falls. I did a flip shot for the Niagara Falls gift shop. Those were awesome. You had those winter. lined up pretty well. Pretty yeah, because I would stand next to a pillar and uh -huh. photograph the pillar, so I knew where I was when I come back the next season, as well as the scene. You photograph where you're standing if you could. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that and then bring a print with you to try and uh, walk slightly sideways and make it look good off the former print but yeah i love stuff like that that's cool well i think i want to thank you for having this conversation with me today i'm going to uh edit it put it up on youtube i'm sure people are going to love it because i've i've certainly oh, enjoyed it so thank, thank you, you for the opportunity you. michael i'm so glad that this project you're doing with all the lenticular people is very very valuable and a lot of fun to thank see. You. Thank you so much for organizing all this. You're welcome.